Good morning and happy 4th of July weekend to everybody. We hope that you've had a chance to uh, spend some time with family and friends and just celebrate the freedoms that we have here in America. And we are so grateful for all of those who have fought to ensure and, and continue those freedoms here. Hey, if you haven't already, please take a moment to fill out one of those online connect cards. Uh, it means so much to know that you're joining us each and every week. There's also a place to write down any prayer requests that you may have. So if there's something going on that we can be praying for, we'd love to know about it and we'd love to be praying for you. Uh, this next week, there's a lot going on that uh, I want to share with you about, and that starts with tomorrow. Tomorrow is our very last day to register for VBS. Uh, we've been talking about how this year our VBS is going to look a little different. Uh, we're going to provide kits for you to do an at-home VBS for you and your family. So if you would like to take part in that, tomorrow, Monday, July 6th, is the last day to register. We need some time to gather everything we need uh, and, and figure out how many kits that we need. And so if you haven't signed up yet, please do so on our website at leclaircc.com. Also next Sunday, uh, July 12th, we are doing another outdoor service. Uh, if you're ready to come back and meet and worship together, we're gonna be meeting in the parking lot again. We're gonna do that at, at 8.30. And uh, again, we do need you to RSVP, which you can do on our website so we can know about how many people are planning to come. But if you feel comfortable and you'd love to uh, meet with some other people here at the church, we would love to have you and would love to see you there. Also happening next week, we have our next Discover LeClaire class. Uh, if you've been visiting with us for a while and wanna know more about what it looks like to be an active partner here at LeClaire, I encourage you to sign up and be a part of this class. Or, or maybe you've been attending here for a few years and you've never attended this class. We still would love for you to join us as well. Right now we're doing those via Zoom. And so once you sign up and register, we'll provide you with the information to uh, be a part of that. Again, that's next Sunday at 1030 that we will be having that. And lastly, again, we are so grateful for the generosity that many of you have shown in this season. Uh, we're continuing to carry on and, and do ministry work, even in this somewhat difficult time. And as a reminder, this week is our Bucks for Blessings week. Uh, every first Sunday, we take a special collection up. Uh, we just ask everyone to consider giving an extra dollar for you and everyone in your family. And though that fund goes to help a, a partnership that we have with LeClaire Elementary and to provide some meals for students that um, are maybe financially more in need of that. And so if you would like to take part in that, if you could help us with that, you can select Bucks for Blessings on the tab whenever you give online. Again, thank you so much for your commitment and your faithfulness through that this entire season. In just a moment, we're going to begin a new series today through the book of James, and I'm excited for uh, the words that Andy is gonna be speaking this morning. But let me open us up with a word of prayer. God, thank you so much for all that you do in our lives and, and we thank you that we can continue to come together and meet together, worship you and, and just dive into your word. I pray today as we go through the book of James that the wisdom that we find there would change our hearts and change our lives, that we would leave today, that we would uh, leave this time thinking differently, and, and I pray that you would continue to be our, our source of, of all, all that we do and, and, and help us just trust in you with everything. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, good morning, everybody. It is uh, such an honor to be able to be with you today. Um, as we're recording this on, on July 1st, I, I realized that we are officially halfway through 2020. And I can honestly say that this year, in, in my 38 years on this planet, this year has been um, unlike any other year before. 
I heard somebody say this the other day and I, I just thought that it was so great. They said that so far, 2020 has been the longest decade of their lives. And I completely agree. I mean, just think about everything that's happened uh, over the course of this year. Everything from, from this virus that is still out there that we still know so little about everything like the shutdowns to the layoffs, the quarantine, to the mandatory homeschooling. But then we've also been faced with the truth of racial injustice and racial tension and all those things. And then just to top it off, like the cherry on top of the Sunday is that this is an election year, which always just brings about so much craziness in and of itself. But with that said, as this tension and as uncertainties boil up around us, if you claim to be a Jesus follower, you are called to be salt and light. You are called to be a peacemaker. You are called to love your enemy and to pray for those who persecute you. You are called to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility to consider others better than yourself. You are called to be different. You, me, we. We are called to be like Jesus. And this is why for the next three weeks, we're going to do this short little sermon series entitled Devoted faithful obedience in the same direction. This past fall, a few of the guys on staff and myself, we had an opportunity to go to a leadership conference in Georgia. And one of the speakers at this conference was a man by the name of Dr. Charles Stanley. And I know that some of you are probably somewhat familiar with with Dr. Stanley and others of you have no earthly idea who he is and and that's perfectly okay. But Dr. Stanley, he, he said this one line And I promise, if he said this one line once, he probably said it 30 different times. But but here's what he said. He said, obey God and leave the consequences to him. Obey God and leave the consequences to him. And I don't think that there is a better piece of advice that, that we could be given today. That we just need to be faithful to Jesus. We just need to be obedient to Jesus. We just need to be devoted to Jesus one day at a time, one step at a time, one decision at a time, one conversation at a time, one social media post at a time. Just keep moving towards him. Just keep pursuing him and leave the consequences to him. And some of the best news that I can give today is that so many of the biblical authors, um, they, they gave us instruction on how we should live in a time of uncertainty and how we should live uh, amidst great tension in life. And one of my favorite New Testament letters was written by a man by the name of James. And one of the reasons I love James so much is because of how applicable his teaching was. And and, and, and so what we want to do for the next three weeks is we just want to, to take a look at a few lessons that, that James gives us that I believe can give us so much hope and so much guidance today. And since we're going to spend a, a little bit of time in James' letter, I, I think it would be wise for us to just gain a little bit of understanding about who James was and, 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 and why James would have taught what James taught And the first thing I want you to know about James is is this, is that James was the half-brother of Jesus. That's pretty cool. And one of the reasons that I, or one of the main proofs that I believe we have for the resurrection of Jesus, and one of the main proofs that we have that Jesus is who Jesus said that he was, is because of what his brother said about him at the beginning of his letter. James said this, James a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about it. What would it take for you to say those words about your brother? 
And James, he didn't always view Jesus in this way. In fact, for most of Jesus' earthly ministry, for all of Jesus' earthly ministry, James was not a follower of his brother. It wasn't until Jesus' resurrection that James became a follower of his brother, that James began to believe that his brother was the son of God and that James would say that his brother was his Lord. And after the resurrection, James, he, he, he became a leader in the church, a leader in the church in Jerusalem, like the place where Jesus was crucified. James became a leader in the church at the scene of the crime. And because Jerusalem was the scene of the crime and, 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 and Jerusalem was kind of just like that epicenter of the Jesus movement, that's where the Jesus followers uh, started out. It makes sense that so much of the earliest persecution that took place against the earliest Jesus followers, it took place in Jerusalem. And we can learn about that in Acts chapter 7 and Acts chapter 8. And what happened as the Christians in Jerusalem were being persecuted is that they began to flee. They began to spread. They began to go to different regions and different areas. But as so many of the Christians, they left Jerusalem because of the persecution, James, he stayed. You, it could be said that as others fled, that James, he stayed and he led, but he didn't only lead, but he also taught. And James, he taught so many incredible things. He taught that our faith, it must act. That if your faith doesn't do anything, then your faith doesn't really exist. He taught us that faith cannot be stagnant. He taught us that faith, he, it moves us to radical obedience. And another thing that I appreciate so much about James, at, at least at times, other times it just frustrates me if I'm being honest, but one thing James was always willing to do was he was willing to say things that his audience and that we need to hear that his audience and we may not want to hear. And he says some of these words at the, right, right out of the gate at the very beginning in James chapter 1, beginning in verse 2. He said, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Okay, so what I want us to do, because I believe if we flip this around, it's a little bit easier for us to understand this as English speakers. So if we flip it around, or let's go ahead and flip it around, and then we'll break it down. So it goes like this. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, consider it pure joy. And as we read through James, or if you've read through James, especially after the sermon series that we just concluded last week, I hope that you would recognize how deeply influenced James was by Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And what, G and what James is saying here is very similar to something that Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, which we talked about last week, whenever Jesus was speaking about the wise and the foolish builder. And something that, that I just want to make sure is understood here is that whenever Jesus is talking about the wise and foolish builder, he's not talking about just two people, but he is encompassing all of humanity in two examples. One of them hears the word of God and does it. The other one hears the word of God and doesn't do it. One of them is wise. The other one is foolish, And there are so many things that the wise and the foolish builder have in common, but one of the things that they have in common is this, is that they both faced storms. Everyone will face storms in life, and that's why James says here, whenever you face trials of many kinds, not if ever, but whenever you face trials of of many kinds. And the word that James uses here for, for, for this idea of face, it's, it, it means to be caught by surprise or, or, or to be caught off guard. What he's telling us is that trials are going to come. No matter how badly you want to avoid pain, sooner or later and in some way, pain is going to find you. And the unfortunate truth of it is this is that there may be little or no warning signs of pain coming. So, whenever, not if ever, but whenever you are caught off guard by trials or unwanted circumstances of many kinds, 
And again, this is something that we know is true. We all face many kinds of trials. There are small trials and there are big trials. We may just run out of gas or we may lose our job. We may have food poisoning or we may find out we have cancer. We may have an inconvenient argument with our spouse or we may find out that our spouse hasn't been faithful. There are so many kinds of trials. There are internal and there are external. There are global and there are personal. There are city and there are neighborhood. All kinds of trials and all kinds of forms. And none of these trials are things that we plan for. None of them are things that we prepared for. They all catch us off guard. But yet we still have to learn how to navigate them. So what does James say we should do as we navigate these trials? He says this. Consider it pure joy. What? (laughs) Like, this is one of those areas where I want to just push back against James a little bit. This is one of those areas where James can can almost come off as as out of touch or at the very least inconsiderate. Like, Like, you don't know the trials of my life, so how are you supposed to tell me that I'm supposed to consider them pure joy? But... If we're being honest, just like Jesus says of the foolish builder in Matthew chapter 7, I think the same thing could be said here, that we would be foolish not to listen to what James has to say. Because what James is telling us is that whenever you face trials, you must reframe your perspective. And remember, as we hear James say these things, James has an intimate knowledge of trials. And the good news is is that James tells us why we should view our trials as pure joy. In verse 3 he says, because you know, you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Because you know, in other words, this is common knowledge. Things like the sky is high and the sun is hot and water is wet, you know, you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. The testing of your faith, it's it's like an uh, authenticator. It's like authenticating your your, your faith. I, uh, a few years ago, there, there was a show that every week, at least once a week, I would record it to my DVR, and it was called Pawn Stars. And uh, Pawn Stars is this show on the History Channel, and, and maybe you're familiar with it, but if you're not, essentially, there's this pawn shop in Las Vegas, and the show shows you what happened at this pawn shop in Las Vegas. And anytime a person would bring in an item to either pawn or sell, if the people who were working at the pawn shop did not have a deep understanding of what this item was, they would always call in an authenticator. The authenticator would come in with their magnifying glass and with all their tools and all their equipment and they would begin to take a deep look, a deep look into whatever this item was and then they would determine after taking a deep look into this item whether it was real or whether it was fake. And James is saying is that, that, that your faith, it is authenticated. It is proven to either be real or fake. Not in the good times, but in your trials. In those moments whenever you are caught off guard by something that you would never ask for. Andy Stanley, he he puts it this way. He says, when circumstances begin to deteriorate, artificial, counterfeit, and what's in it for me, faith, begins to deteriorate right along with it. Come on. If you can't find joy in your trials in any other way, you can at least find at least a small amount of joy in this. That you are discovering how real your faith really is through your trials. You can find just a little bit of joy in this. That we learn things about our faith amidst trials that we could learn in no other way. 
That as our faith is authenticated, as it is tested, that we develop perseverance, we develop uh, uh, endurance, we develop this, this, this staying power, I guess you could say. And, and this next part, it, it is so important. And this is really the bottom line of everything that I want you to hear today. The reason our faith can grow in difficulty, through difficulty, is because our faith doesn't exist to get something from God. Instead, our faith exists because of something God has already done. So James, he would continue and say, so let perseverance finish its work. Don't give up in the middle of it, but let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. In other words, don't give up before the job is done. Malcolm Muggeridge, he, he put it like this. Contrary to what might be expected, I look back on experiences at the time seemed especially desolating and painful with particular satisfaction. Indeed, I can say with complete truthfulness that everything I have learned in my 75 years in this world, everything that has truly enhanced and enlightened my existence, has been through affliction and not through happiness, whether that affliction was pursued or attained. And I would be willing to bet that many of you, that many of us, may say the exact same thing. And this is why, this is why we can consider our trials as joy. Because joy encompasses so, so much more than our current circumstances. Joy is a deeply held belief that spans the entire Christian story. From the, 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 the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. All the way to the hope of a resurrected Savior in Jesus Christ. This is the reason why we can say that when things look their worst, that God is often up to his best. So yes, I, I would encourage you. Pray for your trials to go away. But your faith isn't dependent, is not dependent on trials going away. Yes, whenever you are facing something that just seems insurmountable, pray for a miracle. But your faith doesn't hinge on receiving a miracle. But in the midst of all this, we also must pray that God will use our trials as long as our trials are present in our lives. Because again, our faith doesn't exist to get something from God. Our faith exists because of something that God has already done. And then James would say to any of us who are struggling to gain this perspective, he would say in verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. We should ask God to reframe our, our, our perspective, to allow us to see how he sees, to align our eyes and our purpose with his. And I, 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 I know, I know that this is not an easy teaching. But isn't it true? Isn't it true that, that you are inspired by the people you know who have lived this out? Isn't it true that that on some level you aspire to be like the people you know who have lived this out? I know I am. I know I do. In fact, I can't read James chapter 1 without thinking about the Ledford family. The Ledfords are uh, uh, some of our friends from Joplin, Missouri, and they were a family that whenever you looked at their lives from the outside... <laughs> It appeared that they were living in a state of constant chaos. But man, they loved every minute of it. And they loved each other deeply. Lance and Jackie, they had a slew of kids. And every Sunday they would show up to church approximately 10 minutes late. And, and every Sunday, I can still picture it today, Jackie would come in and, and she would be dragging the kids and trying to get them dropped off where it is that they needed to go and Lance would always be about two steps behind, you know, kind of like that rancher who's herding 
the cattle. And, and Jackie, she was always so bubbly and so encouraging. And you could just tell how much she loved, loved her life and loved her family. And Lance, he, he was quiet. He was reserved, but man, he was a fierce protector. And he was the kind of servant that if he ever met you, whether he knew you or not, and if you had a need, he was going to do whatever he had to do to take care of that need. We had known Lance and Jackie about, about three years whenever they found out that they were pregnant with what I believe was their sixth kid. Uh, they had four boys who were all boy, I mean, just rambunctious, wild kids who were so much fun. But their oldest daughter was just this sweet, sweet girl, and their sixth child was going to be another baby girl. And Lance and Jackie, they, uh, they, they, they had an incredible pregnancy. Jackie had an incredible pregnancy, a healthy pregnancy, and they gave birth to this beautiful, healthy little girl. And they named her Nellie May. And Nellie May, she um, was great. She, she, she was great for a few months. Then eventually, uh, whenever she was probably four, five, six months old, she, she got sick and, 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 and they took her to the doctors and doctors you know, couldn't really figure out anything that was going on, but they definitely didn't seem concerned. And so then the days would pass by and the weeks would pass by and Nellie Mae still, still wasn't getting better. And so they would take her to a different doctor and the doctors, you know, they, they, they would run tests and they would think that they would find the problem. And then they would think that they found a different problem, but, but nothing was really adding up. And so they just said, you know, it's probably just a, a common cold. And so they would just send Jackie and Lance back home with Nellie Mae. Until eventually, whenever Nellie Mae was around six months old, they took her into the hospital and they admitted Nellie Mae and she was in critical condition. And they kept running tests and they kept thinking that they were finding it and then they think they found something else until eventually one Wednesday morning, Nellie Mae was airlifted to a hospital a little bit more than an hour away. And throughout that entire morning, we were checking in on Nellie Mae and just trying to get updates. And at first they told us that they found out what the problem was and that they were going to be able to take care of her. But then as the morning went on, the updates became less and less frequent. And then early in the afternoon, we heard that Nellie Mae wasn't doing good. And then about three or four o'clock that afternoon, we we're told that Nellie Mae was gone. And we were all so heartbroken. We decided to cancel our Wednesday evening programming that night and instead to just hold a special prayer service at the church for Lance and for Jackie and for the kids and, yeah, for Nellie Mae. So we gathered together and we sang and we prayed and I was asked to, to say a few words. But then as we were singing, probably about five or ten minutes before I was to begin speaking, Lance and Jackie come walking down the middle of the church. And I was sitting on the front row and they came and they stood directly to my left. And almost immediately they fell to their knees they grasped each other's hands and with tears just streaming down their face, they outstretched their arms and began to worship. I don't remember a single word I said that night. And I am almost positive that nobody else does either. But the picture of these incredible loving parents on their knees with tears streaming down their face and their arms outstretched wide in worship. That image will be seared into my brain forever. Just hours after their little girl passed away. Lance and Jackie, they did not get what they wanted. 
These were not trials that they asked for. These were not trials that they were prepared for, but their faith was not tethered to them getting their way. Instead, their faith was tethered to an event, something that Jesus had already done nearly 2,000 years earlier. So, G G church, I, 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 I need you to hear this. What God is doing in the center of your trial is at the very center of what God is doing in your life. We may not like that. We may wish that it was different. But that is the truth that allowed James to be bold enough to say these words. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. So let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Will you pray with me today? My Father in heaven, come to you in this moment and I just ask that you will help us to see as you see. That we live in a day and age where trials and uncertainty and tension are literally everywhere we turn. And Father, we live in a day and age right now to where it is so easy to become jaded, to where it is so easy to just dig in our heels and say that we know enough and to stop learning where it's so easy to just tune out the voices that don't agree with us and to just focus on what further um, confirms our bias. Jesus, we live in a time of so much division. And so I pray that you will give us the perspective to be able to consider it all pure will allow us to see that you are doing things that we cannot see. That you are laying before us opportunities for your people to act like your people, to live like you and to love like you and to speak like you and to feel like you. Jesus, that you're giving us an opportunity to be a light in the darkness. So may we find joy in that. And God, I pray for those who are dealing with their trials and it may not be on a national level or a pandemic level, but it is a very, very personal level. God, I pray that you will remove their trials. I pray for a miracle. But Father, I pray that you will allow us to see that you are going to use our trials until you choose to remove them. Father, thank you for the hope that we have in you and for the hope that we have in your son Jesus and for the hope that we can have that our faith is not dependent on what we feel or what we're experiencing or receiving or getting something from you because you've already done everything and sending your son to die in our place and to give us new hope, a new life, and a new heart. Jesus, we love you. It's in your name we pray. So right now we're going to move into our time of communion. And what I would like to encourage you to do is to think about right now the joy that you can have in what Jesus has done for you. Just think about the joy that you can have in what Jesus has done for you. Yeah, things are going to come into life that we wish weren't there. Things that we don't understand and things that we wish we could just remove in a moment. But think about the joy that you can have and what Jesus has done for you. And take the bread which represents his body and take the juice which represents his blood. And think about the joy that you can have and what Jesus has done. Give you glory.
glory for all you've brought me through and now I'm ready for whatever you want to do I'm moving forward to follow after
When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken my feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. shame no longer has place to hide I am not a captive to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind cause I won't be shaken I won't be shaken
Hey church, we hope that you enjoyed today's service. We want to remind you that if you are able to give, you can do so at leclaircc.com. Also, if you have prayer requests, please send them in so that we can pray with you and for you. And last but not least, we hope that you will join us next week as we continue our series in the book of James called Devoted. We'll see you then.